Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Um, my name is Ron, a um, bit of an explorer and adventurer up in the North Cotswolds. Um, for my regular subscribers, um, I'm finally getting out and about. Um, initially I'm going back to Hook Norton to have a look at the Earl of Dudley's uh, ironstone operation. Um, but I think probably the best thing to do before we start that adventure is to put some detail on who the Earl of Dudley actually was. Um, so let's put a picture up of the first Earl of Dudley. There he is. Uh, resplendent in the uniform. He was the uh, Colonel Commander of the Worcestershire Hussars back in the mid 1850s. Um, on the death of his father he inherited Himley Hall, um, a rather palatious mansion uh, close to Dudley in the West Midlands. He also inherited Dudley Castle. Um, we all know what Dudley Castle looks like. Um, and he inherited a private railway um, with links to all the uh, relevant main lines in the West Midlands. And um, he's probably pretty well known for funding on his own um, the complete restoration of Worcester Cathedral. Um, his private photographs of his or drawings of his private uh, railway are not really in existence that much because it evolved so much um, in the 1800s that um, nobody ever really managed to put down a definitive map of his private railway. Um, his uh, op Einstein operation began in uh, 1901 in Hook Norton. Unfortunately, the first Earl had been dead 16 years when the operation started. Um, and presumably, the success his successor, um, William Ward, his namesake, or William Humble Ward, the second Earl of Dudley, um, would have taken over um, the uh, operation. It seems a little bit odd that um, given the vast amount of collieries, ironworks and uh, the massive round oak foundry in the West Midlands, what the uh, Earl was actually doing in, uh, at the bottom of the field in Hook Norton. Um, haven't managed to resolve that one yet, but um, that's the Earl. First Earl of D uh, Dudley, uh, William Ward, succeeded by his son, the second Earl of Dudley, William Humble Ward. Hope that gives you some background. Um, if you're interested, this is rather splendid book by Ned Williams, um, the Earl of Dudley's Railway. Details at 15 quid. Uh, lots of information in there and uh, a pretty good read, highly recommended. So um, it's a case of flasks and sandwiches at the ready. Um, at the beginning of this next video I'm just going to pop up to South Hill Cutting just down from the uh, Hook Norton Tunnel because I've got finally got the information I needed about the little wooden cross. If you remember from the second video, the guy that uh, is uh, commemorated on that little wooden cross, I'll fill you in on that uh, at the start of the next video. Um, and also, um, it appears that um, the trees in the South Hill cutting, the very deep cutting, have now got ash tree dieback. Um, I'll fill you in on the detail of that uh, when we get on site. Okay? So, if you like what I'm doing, uh, please like and subscribe and uh, tap that notification bell. And um, as they say, let's away to the woods.
Well, this path has now been closed for getting on for a year due to uh, this ash tree dieback uh, episode. Um, from what I can see, there's been no remedial work done. Um, what they normally do is either leave it because it's so isolated and uh, hope for the best, or they come in and completely clear fell the whole area. Um, I'm really hoping they don't that, do that because it will completely destroy this uh, quite unique ecosystem. So I'll keep you all posted and we'll wait on developments. I just popped up here briefly um, because I've now got some further information on this memorial cross. Um, in November 1890, James Lamb was dispatched to the, up to the railway um, to warn rail traffic of a landslide. Um, I still don't know the events that led up to his death, but tragically he was run over. Um, a very sad ending to uh, this particular story. The story of the uh, Earl of Dudley's calcining uh, ironstone works starts at the bottom of this valley in that circle of trees. Um, Processing of ironstone started in 1901 and strangely ended in 1916 and it's thought that maybe the uh, quarries had all been worked out but uh, it seems very odd that right in the middle of the Great War um, they should stop processing ironstone. Maybe the alternative solution is uh, all the able-bodied men had gone to war. Don't know. It's a conundrum. Anyway, down in that uh, what is now a uh, small copse or woodland was a 65 foot high um, ironstone calcining kiln with a huge concrete ramp on one side which, um, which they used to feed the ironstone up the ramp using ropes and pulleys um, and an 11 man team would load the ironstone into the top of the kiln a ratio of 500 weight of coal to one tonne of ironstone and then the kiln would be fired when it was full. Um, principal man in charge of the kiln was the uh, the gas man, let's call him the gas man, he was responsible for firing the kiln as safely as possible. Um, they were using coal gas as a fuel, which uh, must have been interesting. Um, and then, I'll just tip a little bit, unbelievably, um, tubs of, of calcined ironstone were brought up this valley um, to a gantry over a railway which we're currently sitting somewhere near. Um, and from the gantry it was tipped into railway wagons, taken across to the main line from Hook Norton to Chipping Norton and transported to uh, the West Midlands. At the same time, wagon loads of coal were being shipped in and sent down the valley to the kiln um, using a friction wheel with ropes and of course the, the classic the full tubs going down the hill pulling the empty tubs up the hill to the railway for removal and refilling. Um, I'm just going to pan left now um, just to pick up the main line or the trees where the main line is hidden. 
pan right round to somewhere there and I'm having difficulty seeing the screen at the moment. There's somewhere there where that clump of bushes is, if you can see it. Um, a branch line came off the main line and it crossed this field um, for some distance towards Wigginton, a little village up the valley um, and terminated in an, an old worked out um, stone quarry. Um, it's standard gauge obviously because it's feeding off a standard gauge line. Um, completely disappeared now but apparently much of the infrastructure was still in place up until August 1982 including the kiln and the ramp um, and the records show that um, at that point it was quote bulldozed um, and returned to agriculture so you're going to have to bear with me on this one because I don't think there's an awful lot of evidence left as to what was going on here but um, we'll certainly have a good look and the next objective is to go back to the main line and see if we can locate the point where the uh, branch line departed the main line. Um, of most interest is the fact that the just before the uh, the line came across the field um, it was blocked with double 12 foot field gates, wooden 12 foot field gates of uh, fairly substantial proportion um, with consequently two pretty substantial probably 15 or 16 inch square probably oak gate posts. Um, the uh, gates were inset they didn't actually follow the original uh, railway boundary fence line on the right hand side they were inset a good maybe 10-12 feet um, and there should be evidence of replacement of wire fencing maybe a, maybe a strainer and a strut possibly evidence of post holes certainly the gates have gone now but um, no doubt they were taken away and uh, and uh, gifted to somebody to put across the bottom of the drive so we'll uh, call it a day here and then we'll press on go down to the uh, main line again and um, see if we can pick up the, the spot where the branch line crosses this field heading back towards the uh, main line lovely afternoon and uh, let's see if uh, we can locate the point where the branch line left the main line. We can see the main line track bed just in front of us now. And you can see just in front uh, the last vestiges of the uh, South Hill cutting. So we'll follow that along, heading in the direction of Hook Norton and Old Hook Norton Station, and need the two viaducts. Always extremely overgrown at this time of the year, constantly battling stinging nettles and. Uh, Goose grass, not my favourite to uh, plant, it must be said. Seem to wish I'd worn a long sleeve jumper. Now that's of interest. There's like an almost like a sinkhole there. So I'm going to have to get down in there somehow and have a look at that. And from what I can see across the other side of that rather deep dip is a metal straining post. Let's see if I can get down in there without breaking my neck and getting stung to death. Bear with me. 
Yeah, yeah. Very damp down in here. Um, you get the feeling this is the point. Or certainly the main area where the track or the branch line departed. I could be wrong. Anyway, here we have something very interesting. Well, this is the, uh, looks like the uh, strainer and strut. Good old uh, Brunel broad gauge rail, our old friend. This looks like the point where they, uh, following the removal of the gates, they uh, re realigned the, uh, all the line wires uh, back to their original positions. Um, there is a strut lying on the floor. That's collapsed. Just about to see it, I think. Down there. So, this point and uh, further on through there is where the gates were originally. Very overgrown at this time of year. Difficult to see anything very much. But um, I think we're at the point where the uh, branch line went out into the field. Okay, we'll leave this area now, but it looks to me like they've gone in there and not only removed the uh, double gates, but removed a load of the ballast as well. For, for reuse, presumably, somewhere. Okay, we'll uh, about face and we'll head on towards the uh, circular wood down in the valley. Okay. Almost at the bottom of the little path that runs down the side of the embankment. I've just passed the uh, buttress of the entrance to the main viaduct. And coming to view Pier 1, Pier 2 and the top of Pier 3 of the main viaduct. So we're down at, back down at ground level. Let's hope this footpath continues because we're fast approaching the uh, wood where the site of the kiln was located. I'm just that on my way through the vegetation. Not much fun. And dive into the trees. There we are. This of course is not natural woodland. If I can demonstrate here, a row of trees, not just random. So we'll follow this path. These trees, I suspect, were probably planted not long after the site was bulldozed in 1982. Maybe 85, 86, certainly not that old. Difficult to keep your bearings in here without being able to see the viaduct. But somewhere down here would definitely have been the kiln. there. I have to say too, due to the clearing we may literally be looking, if anything, for, a, for an area of burning. But, uh, this was clearly cultivated before it was planted with trees. and it looks more up on the hill. Let's cut around this way a little bit. Not looking too promising at the moment. We'll look over here. Just a 
at the, the edge of the planting and that's natural woodland through there. Okay. a uh, steam engine. The steam engine uh, was used to power the, the tubs of ironstone up the valley using an endless cable system. Um, well, all I can say is my garden in the kiln, there it was, gone sign anything. Not even lumps of calcium stone. That's a pity. So the only option that we have then is to revert to uh, pictorial evidence. I've got some two or three really nice photographs of the uh, calcium kiln and uh, associated machinery. We'll retreat back to the uh, little path at the foot of the embankment and we'll have a look at the uh, photographic evidence. Okay, I'm back on the path now that traverses the side of the embankment. Um, I'm going to put up this first photograph, um, quite a rare photograph that shows the two viaducts and the station in the distance in relation to the calcining kiln. This photo was taken in around 1903. Um, normally the viaducts would be covered in smoke from the kiln. Um, so this photograph is pretty unique. Um, the next photograph I think was taken in 1906. Um, a much clearer view of uh, the operation um, showing the uh, steam engine house and uh, a building to the right of that which could be accommodation or a workshop don't really know um, the cigar shaped object I presume is a coal gas tank um, and that's quite a clear photograph so uh, from that to today, well, there's absolutely nothing whatsoever remaining other than trees, um, I guess is fairly inevitable. So what was life like at the quarry face? And who worked there? This photo shows uh, four men with picks and crowbars. They're responsible for uh, undermining the base layers of the ironstone um, to such a point where the upper layers collapse hopefully not burying and killing them but uh, it was a risky business um, they could use hand tools if it was uh, soft layers of stone where it was really hard um, they used explosives the two guys at the top of the picture are the toppers um, their job is to uh, clear the overburden, that's the topsoil and the subsoil, down to the top layer of uh, ironstone. Um, for that they got paid the princely sum of three and a half pence between them. Um, the guy in charge of the wheelbarrow, um, which was known as run, running the planks, um, had to negotiate a one foot wide 
fairly bouncy plank over the uh, working, um, which could in some instances be uh, 25 feet off the quarry floor. Um, if you've tried running a, a very heavy laden wheelbarrow up a long scaffold plank, you'll know what I mean. When it starts to bounce, if you're not in sync with it, you're off the plank. Very dangerous. Um, the four men were expected to load and clear 25 tonnes of ironstone each a day. And for one tub of ironstone, which was about 2,500 weight, a man would be paid four and a half P or four and a half old pence. <coughs> The idea was generally to uh, load the bigger pieces by hand and the smaller pieces would be dealt with with a trusty iron uh, stone fork, eight time stone fork, very useful for picking up smaller pieces of stone. Um, it must have been absolutely backbreaking work. It was a six day week um, in all weathers, starting at six o'clock in the morning and finishing either when it was dark or when they'd cleared their acquired load for the day. The bigger um, sites used um, riddles to clean the stone before it was calcined. They also used uh, narrow gauge locomotives, made life easier and eventually they ended up with steam diggers which of course um, did away with the toppers, the guys who cleared the topsoil by hand um, and uh, it was a very hard life. It, it supplied um, jobs for a lot of the people in Hook Norton um, and a wage uh, as did the railway but um, it was a very very hard life. Um, the final picture I've got here um, I only discovered very recently it was taken in 1910 and it's the best photo yet of the uh, of the actual kiln. There doesn't seem to be an awful lot going on there. But if you look around, you can see various cables on uh, trestles um, running here, hither and thither across the landscape. Um, one of the quarries um, had to utilise some sort of turntable um, because the the tramway came out of the quarry and turned at 90 degrees towards the kiln whereby the men in charge had to unhook the tubs turn them 90 degrees hook them back up again and these are loaded better in mind um, and send them on their way to the kiln um, rather a strange setup but when you're i don't know five six hundred yards from the main line um, as your only means of access to the main line. I guess you'll use any means possible to get the stone out calcined and onto the train as quickly as possible. Um, most odd. Um, as a footnote, in 1960 a consortium of quarrymen, call them what you will, um, or owners of land with ironstone deposits, approached the government to issue licenses to reopen stone quarries over a 4,000 acre area kind of south and east of Banbury. Um, this went to uh, an appeal. There was a massive objection to it and ultimately the minister in charge declined all the licenses and uh, the ironstone industry in the area faded into history. <laughs>